Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Caitlin Seagraves and I work at Central Library. Today we're going to be talking about digital privacy and security. Um, we have Luke Crouch presenting today. He is a privacy engineer with Mozilla and a volunteer with Techlahoma, which is a group we work with pretty often at the library, and I'm sure he will tell you more about it. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to him and thank you all for coming. This is recorded, so if you are unable to stay for the whole thing or want to reference it later, I will post the link um, on our website later. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was about to just type it right into the title of the slide. So, um, hey everybody. So, uh, like Caitlin said, uh, my name is Luke. I am a privacy and security engineer for Firefox, which is a browser for all major platforms. You can get it anywhere. Um, and so, privacy and security is my full time job, uh, especially sort of the digital online privacy and security stuff. Uh, I also am a volunteer and a board member uh, at Techlahoma Foundation, which is a Oklahoma-wide nonprofit that uh, advances the grassroots tech community in the state. So we host about 30 to 40 uh, on, on now all online meetups. Um, and then as soon as we can get back in person, we're planning to. Uh, we're also doing... Uh, two events this year. One is 200 OK, which is May 15th. Uh, it'll be an online event. That'll be at 200 OK.us. That is more of a web developer event. Um, and we also have some sort of civic community project things that we do uh, under the Tech Oklahoma thing. We do workshops as well for learning to code and things like this. Um, so uh, before I jump into my usual talk, uh, I asked Caitlin to sort of try to get a feel for as a whole bunch of our lives are moving into online areas, um, where maybe before we were doing things in person, now we're doing a lot more things online. Um, there's some new, uh, or at least more, online privacy and security concerns that we all have. And so I'm gonna try and talk through some of the basics, uh, which apply everywhere. And then in the last couple of weeks, there have been a couple of good resources coming out for people that are now having to work from home or school from home or things like that. Um, and just sort of some of the specific things there. Uh, I have looked at some of those resources. A lot of them are the same kind of stuff we're gonna talk about here, um, but then I want to get through the basic stuff quickly and then hopefully open it up to questions um, because I wasn't able to package up a bunch of uh, work from home, school from home content quite yet. Uh, but most of the stuff I'm gonna talk about here that is in slides is applicable anywhere and everywhere, whether you're working or schooling or whatever you're doing online. Okay, so whenever um, we talk about online privacy, one of the things that I always try to ask people is why uh, they haven't already taken more steps to protect their digital identity. And the answer that is most popular is that it seems really complicated and it's gonna take too much time. Um, so the bad news is that it is a little bit complicated. Um, I work in this area and I try to make products that make this stuff simpler, um, but it is, it's hard to make it simple, so it is a little bit complicated, but the good news is that you can set up a lot of good protections in just a few minutes, and it doesn't have to be too hard. Um, so I'm gonna give you some resources. We'll also send the slides out afterwards, uh, like we usually do, um, but things you can check out uh, for later. Uh, one is ssd.eff.org, and this stands for Surveillance Self-Defense from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, so the EFF has been around for as long as computers have been around, since the 70s, I think, and they've been putting out materials on basically how to uh, kind of keep your digital rights sort of stuff. Um, so they have a great batch of materials there. One of the things that they point out a lot is security is a process, not really a purchase. Um, so if anyone's trying to sell you the one thing that's going to fix all of your security problems, yeah, probably not. Uh, probably not going to do it. What you really should do more is think in terms of what security people call a threat model. Um, so threat models are what do you want to protect? From whom are you wanting to protect it? How likely is it that you need to protect it? How bad are the consequences of failure? And how much trouble are you willing to go through to prevent those? So um, it, it's helpful to think in terms of this because uh, 
if you tried to make yourself secure against anything and everything all the time, you would go crazy trying to do that, right? Like I'm, even I'm sure I haven't got everything right. Uh, what I do is I think about, you know, the things that I am concerned about and what I can do about it. So with that, we're gonna ask sort of what is your threat model? Um, Wired Magazine had this pretty cool sort of guide, uh, sort of three major buckets that they put people in, just civilian, just the average consumer, um, or public figures, and then straight up spies, right? Um, so for the most part, we all land in a sort of civilian bucket. At Firefox, we've done research to ask the average consumer, um, sort of if, who are you worried about? Uh, and the ones that, we, that people say they're worried about are the hackers, uh, bad websites, companies that collect and sell information about them. And then social networking companies and things like that tend to be at the top. Um, and then we ask people sort of what data are you most interested in protecting? And it comes up with some of the things you would expect, financial data, bank account, PIN numbers, credit cards, um, passwords, all these kinds of things that you sort of would expect um, that people want to keep protected. Um, so for this talk, I'm going to assume that we're all sort of in the average consumer profile. Um, what we mostly want to protect is some of our consumer personally identifiable information like our bank accounts, some of our browsing history, our health data history, things like that. We want to protect it from bad websites, data brokers, hackers, social networks, those sort of top three that we see in our surveys. Um, none of us are really a special target for any attackers. Um, I do have a batch of slides for people that are more in that uh, public figure area, uh, but we won't necessarily get into that today. Um, and then the worst case scenario is like total identity theft is the worst thing that can happen to us. Somebody gets in and takes over our identity and takes over our bank accounts and all that kind of stuff. So we are worst case scenario. This is what I'm gonna call sort of the average consumer profile. And it's what we're gonna talk about most today. Um, so with that, if you are in this bucket, then again, the good news is a few simple things can go a really long way uh, to helping you out, especially if you're not already doing these things. Uh, so there is this uh, article. It's a bit old, but it's still pretty relevant. Um, the Consumer Reports has a 10 minute digital privacy tune up. Um, so you can go search for this one, uh, get it from Consumer Reports. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of the same stuff they talk about. And we're going to go from the easiest things to the hardest things. Uh, so the first thing is to turn on automatic updates and install them. So every device uh, has, every device operating system has sort of software updates that they want you to install. Um, what this protects you from is sort of bad websites and hackers that can essentially take over your whole computer and then steal anything or get to anything that your computer can do. Um, so uh, what we're protecting from is, is called malware, which stands for malicious software. Um, and hopefully everyone's at least heard this term, um, but basically malicious software, we used to just call it viruses. Now there's all kinds of different kinds and we just call it malware. Um, but the way that sort of malware and bad software gets on your device is usually an email attachment or you go to a bad website link or something. Um, sometimes people use USB drives or other drives that um, have malware on them. So probably the number one thing is the email attachments. Um, these are the most dangerous. Hopefully uh, a lot of people now are very cautious of email attachments and opening email attachments. Um, if you, the, the basic rule of thumb is if you get an email attachment from someone that you're not really expecting, uh, double check with them. So someone sends you an email, it looks a little weird, it has an attachment on it, you know, call them, text them, do something that's not an email to ask them if they really were sending that. Is that, did you really mean to send that? Is that, you know, it's just kind of weird. You sent me a PDF and you never send me PDFs or something like that. Um, so just double check if you get an email attachment that seems unusual from somebody you don't usually get attachments from. Um, don't open it, double check with them first. That's, uh, and if they say, no, I didn't send anything, probably you may have to tell them, oh, I think, I think someone might be using your email account or something. Um, and then on the websites, so don't visit suspicious links. Um, 
I, I don't have, I can't, I can't uh, shame anyone, make you all raise your hands for how many people have seen if your web browser tells you, you know, stop, there's a security problem on this website, you know, don't proceed or whatever. Um, so I, I have worked on the part of Firefox that, that does that. And there's a very good reason why you see those sort of warnings in your browser. And that's because either the security between your browser and that site is not secure, um, or in some cases that site has been taken over by an attacker or a hacker uh, who's trying to do bad things with that site. Um, so if you ever get that warning from your browser that says, uh, you know, don't have, the, this site has a security problem or whatever, um, then you should uh, definitely don't, don't click the button that says, <laughs> you know, proceed anyway. Uh, click, click the button that says, get me out of here. Um, and then the last one, which is sometimes a funny story, is not to use unknown drives. So um, I think the story that I've told people before is uh, there are sort of ethical hackers. Um, they are, they're, they're you know, uh, hackers who will get hired by a business and then they will try to hack into the business, see how they might be able to hack into the business and then give a report to the business that says, here's all the vulnerabilities that we found. So you need to go fix these things. And one of the stories out of these hackers is that they can put malware on USB drives. They'll go and just drop a bunch of these USB drives outside the door of the office or whatever. And a bunch of employees see these USB drives on the ground. They pick them up and they go, oh, this must, somebody must have dropped this USB drive and they take it to their computer and they plug it into their computer to find out whose USB drive it is. And now they have malware on the work machine. So um, if, you find, <laughs> if you find USB drives or any sort of drives uh, lying around on the floor, don't plug them into your computer. Um, so this leads us to uh, these automatic updates. So all of those bad things that I just described, the automatic updates uh, that your operating system, whether that's on your laptop, your desktop, so Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, um, Linux, whatever you're using, there's a reason that these uh, automatic updates are being installed. It's because they are closing these security vulnerabilities that the malware tries to make use of. So you should always uh, keep the automatic updates turned on. Um, you should install them. Uh, the software companies, so Apple, Microsoft, Google, um, they're trying to make it easy for you to stay secure with these automatic updates. So that's what the automatic updates are for, is to help you stay secure, and they're trying to make it as easy as possible. So you should definitely keep these on um, and install these. Uh, when you get sort of a prompt for an automatic update or a security update, you want to make sure that it's coming from, not from your web browser. It should be coming in the little tray icon on a Windows uh, machine, or it should come from, you know, the system, the operating system alert should tell you that there's an update available. Uh, you should never trust so like if you visit a website and all of a sudden the website is trying to tell you hey there's a software update that you need to install uh, it's probably trying to get you to install some bad software right um, so you should never see one of these prompts when you visit a web page it should only come from for example in windows at the bottom there's a you know tap bar with all the icons so that it should be in that area it should never come from your web browser um, okay, the second one, um, and here we're gonna get we're gonna get to talk a, a little bit about some of the stuff that's going on um, online in, the, in sort of the online security world in response to all of the uh, all of the COVID stuff. Um, so learn to identify phishing. Um, so uh, the 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 one that I have led with in the past, I'll probably update this story to be more uh, of a modern story soon. Uh, the phishing email that hacked the account of John Podesta. So this was the whole uh, uh, email campaign during election campaign thing. And there was, you know, uh, hacking of emails and all this other kind of stuff. And the DNC got hacked and it all started with a phishing email. Um, so even things that sound sort of benign like phishing can have really, really big consequences. Uh, let's skip the data stuff. <laughs> um, 
So what phishing does is it tries to get you to give up your username and password for a site. So that's what we mean when we talk about phishing. Um, so let's go, sorry, I'm jumping around. I should have gone through this before. Um, so your email account, does it use the same password as other accounts? And can it reset your password at other accounts? Right, so if you're reusing it, we'll talk about passwords here in a little bit. Um, but just to sort of emphasize the danger of accidentally giving up your username and password is that if you're using the same password as uh, on your email address and your bank account and these other things, as soon as somebody fishes your password once, uh, they could get into all kinds of things, right? Um, so you have to be really, really mindful of phishing and where you're putting in your password and make sure that you know where you're putting your password in. Um, so there is uh, this site, which as a security person really bothers me because it is the real site, but it looks like a phishing site. It's called phishingquiz.withgoogle.com. Um, and so this is uh, a site where Google will just kind of like walk you through some examples of what a phishing email looks like or what a phishing website looks like. Um, I'm going to show the example from, uh, this is actually the email that was sent to John Podesta that phished his account that gave hackers uh, basically access to the Democratic National Committee during the 2016 election. Um, so in this particular email, it's coming from, they've, they've, they've faked the from part here at the top that says no replied at accounts.googlemail.com. Uh, and they have put subject, someone has your password. So this phishing, phishing emails and scam emails tend to start with something very urgent. They make you feel scared. They make you feel like, oh crap, I need to do something really quickly right now. Um, that's part of the phishing or the scam is to get you to be afraid, like you need to do something immediately, quickly, without thinking too long. Um, so it says someone has your password, someone just used your password to try to sign into your Google account, this. Um, and then they put some fake details here. It was this date, it was at this IP address, which they just made up. They made the location Ukraine, because we all know, you know, hackers are from Eastern Europe for some reason, so that must be, that must be scary. Um, it says, Google stopped this attempt. You should change your password immediately. And it has this change password link. Um, and then the problem here is that the change password link is not a, not a legitimate link at all. So this bit.ly, um, all of these links that you might see that look suspicious, like what is bit.ly? Why is Google not have a google.com link um, in their communications? That's very suspicious. So this. This here, this is the most sort of uh, mindful, most, the most obvious sort of signal that this is a phishing attempt, is that it's telling you, here's your change password, here's your change your Google password link, and it's not going to Google at all, right? It's going to some weird link. Um, so this is uh, probably the, the, the most obvious signal. And what I tell people is that, if you get an email or something from PayPal or from Google or from your bank that you think is legit, like, oh, you need to go change your password, don't ever click on links that are in the emails. Um, what you do is close the email um, and go to that website directly at the address that you know that it is, right? Or like we, like we do with attachments on emails, um, you know, call your bank or call whoever and say, I just got this email that says that my, I need to change my online banking password. I don't even have an online banking account. I didn't know I had one, right? And call them up and they'll say, oh yeah, no, we didn't send that, right? Um, so the, probably the, the things to definitely make sure you're aware of with phishing, it will always make it, really scary. The email will always make it sound like something is very scary and you need to do something right away without thinking too long. That's part of the trick of email and scam of fishers and scammers is that they want you to feel afraid and feel like you have to do something very urgently without thinking. Um, and then the second thing is uh, the website that they're going to send you to 
is going to not have the official like google.com or paypal.com. It's going to be usually going to be some kind of URL that looks a little funny, uh, a, a, a website link that looks a little funny, that looks a little suspicious. Um, so that's that. And sort of just as a note, um, the same sort of phishing and scamming techniques that have been used to fish passwords and this kind of stuff are now being used uh, with COVID-19 type um, content. So what people are saying is there's scammers that are out there and either putting up websites or they're sending out emails that say uh, someone accessed your, your, your COVID-19 stimulus check or something. Like someone has your COVID-19 stimulus check, right? And they're trying to scare you with obviously COVID, right, being scary. Um, obviously your money, right? So they're saying, oh, we've got your money and it's COVID and you need to do something like the scammers are using this, which is, I've, I've never, I, don't, I didn't, I thought I was angry at scammers before until I started using COVID to scam people. And then I, I found a new level of anger to hate them with. But like they're, they're definitely out there trying to use these same sort of tactics and they're bringing this whole COVID thing into it. So they're trying to scam people um, with scary COVID sounding things. Um, so be mindful of that. And I can point you at a couple of podcasts that have some specifics. Um, and we'll, we'll, I'll send that out later. Okay, so uh, Password Manager can help prevent phishing attacks, but we'll talk more about Password Managers later. Um, another thing to sort of, uh, that, we will, that we'll also talk about is two-factor authentication can help prevent phishing attacks. Um, so those are two things that can really help prevent these phishing attacks, in addition to just being mindful about them. Um, but let's go to the next. So password managers are a little bit hard to use. Let's go back to something that's pretty easy to use. Uh, so this is screen locks on all of your devices. Um, so screen lock is uh, going to protect you if uh, <laughs> the example I used to use, not really a concern right now, is if you're at a coffee shop and you leave your laptop and go to the bathroom and you left your screen unlocked, then someone could just pick up your laptop and go do whatever they could do with it. Um, what screen locks do is it just locks the screen. So this is on your phone or on your laptop or anything like that. You just want to lock the device so that you have to enter in your password when you come back to it. Um, so I, you know, have worked in a co-working space and I see people leave their laptops out all the time with sensitive things on it and unlocked screens. And I'm just like, I don't, <laughs> it just, I try, I try to not preach at everybody all the time, but yeah, they're just leaving all of their screens completely unlocked so that if anybody happened to wander in and just pick up their laptop and go, then they could do whatever they want with that. Because those devices, when they're unlocked, are probably able to do that person's banking, probably able to access that person's emails, which means that they could go to some account and say that they forgot the password and reset the password with an email and all these other terrible things that can happen if you don't lock your screens. Um, uh, okay, so uh, those first three are pretty easy. Uh, automatic updates, uh, be aware of phishing uh, and sort of scammy emails, and then uh, lock your screens. Um, always using HTTPS. So uh, if you've ever seen this green padlock, uh, this is a sign that is, it's, it's, it's an icon that's usually put into web browsers, and it means that the connection between uh, your browser and that site is secure, uh, which means that um, this protects you from uh, hackers that might be sitting on a public network. So when I give this talk at the library, a lot of people are on the Tulsa Library uh, Wi-Fi network, and everyone who's on it is on it with everybody else. So if we're all sitting on the same Wi-Fi network, I can actually look at the traffic. If I'm sitting on the network, I can look at the traffic that's going from your computer to the site you're looking at, um, unless you have HTTPS. That green padlock stops me from doing that. So if we're on the same uh, network and you're uh, at a site that has the green padlock, uh, then I wouldn't be able to do that, even though I'm sitting on the same network as you are. Um, so what it looks like when it is not secure, uh, this is kind of an old screenshot, but uh, there's typically in the address bar, 
hopefully there's some kind of very obvious symbol that says not secure or a padlock that's crossed out or something like that. Um, the, the worst case scenario is that if you're sitting on one of these pages and it tries to like ask for a password or something, um, because if I was on the same network as you and you punched your password into this page, I would definitely be able to see your password and I would be able to steal your password. Um, so this is, this is anytime you are entering in a password or entering in some piece of information that you think is sensitive, just look up at the address bar again and make sure that if there's a padlock there. And to cut, uh, um, we yeah. have a question from Emily. She was wondering, um, how do you know if the green lock is legitimate? Could it also be spoofed? Good question. So um, I don't know if you all can see my mouse on the screen share or not. Maybe. OK. Um, so the padlock will always need to be up here in, in this area. Um, so this is, gets into the specifics of web browsers. Uh, when we work on web browsers, the part of the web browser that I work on that you can see is this top part. So this right here is sort of the browser part. It's where the tab bar is, the location bar, and things like that. Uh, everything underneath here, this part here is the website itself right here. So where you want to see the padlock is up here right next to the address of the site that you're on. So it needs to be up here where the browser uh, interface is not where the page content is. Um, so there is a tool called HTTPS Everywhere. Um, and this is an add-on that you can install uh, to your browser. What it will do is it will make sure that, um, because none of us actually type in HTTP, you know, colon slash slash www.espn.com. None of us do that. We just type in espn.com or Paypal.com. We just type in something.com. Um, what this extension does is it makes sure that if the site you're trying to visit has HTTPS, it will only connect over HTTPS. Um, so sometimes if you type in ESPN.com, it'll first try to that insecure site, and then hopefully that site will send you to the secure version. But if that site doesn't, this tool will make sure that you're always using HTTPS as much as possible. You have to hear kiddos who are sad about um, lunch choices, I guess. Sorry, I muted myself to save everybody from the sound, but then <laughs> it asked me to. Uh, okay. The next one, um, and this one is, I'm, we're getting progressively harder. This one I'm not great at either, because uh, I have my, my little backup thing has been warning me for the last couple of days that I need to do it. Uh, but basically, make backups. Um, and so what backups do is sort of, if you do get hit with malware or something happens to your computer, um, a backup lets you sort of restore. Um, so the one that I talk about here is if you've, if you've heard of ransomware, um, what ransomware does is essentially someone gets some malware on your machine and what hackers realized was that if they infect your machine, they may not really know what the most valuable data is on your machine to try to steal or whatever. What they can do is they can break your machine because the most, it's most valuable to you. So they get some malware on your machine and then they encrypt all of your data so that you can't get to it because that data is really the most valuable to them, to, to you, not to them. So when they do this, uh, what ransomware does is they got some malware on your machine, they encrypted everything, and then you get a big thing that says uh, your files have been encrypted. Um, so you are then required to pay uh, some Bitcoin to them, and then they will give you the key to unlock your files, and you can have your computer back, right? Um, so what backups do is, if you do get some malware, a virus, or ransomware, um, you can restore your machine from like yesterday's backup, right, from before you had it. Um, so that's, that's the goal of having backups, is to prevent things like this. So when something does go bad or wrong, or you get some malware, you can go back in time to 
uh, when you didn't have it. So both um, on a Mac and on Windows, uh, they both have sort of backup and restore built into uh, the systems. Um, we won't dive too deep into that because it's a big, <laughs> really big topic. Okay, so uh, number six, use tracking protection. Um, so tracking protection is, this is where we start to protect from sort of online data brokers and social networks that are sort of watching you do things online, right? Um, so now I get to plug what I work on, which is the Firefox browser. Uh, Firefox browser has private browsing feature and our private browsing feature, uh, which is unlike Chrome, actually has tracking protection built into it. Um, so when you are in a Firefox private window, we actually block all trackers um, from seeing what you're doing. So in Chrome incognito windows, uh, the, it will erase the history of that window from your local computer. But when you're browsing incognito, Google and Facebook and Twitter and all these other trackers can still see everything that you're doing in the incognito window, right? Uh, does not block any of them. Whereas private browsing in Firefox does block trackers. So that's my probably most <laughs> Uh, shameless plug for using Firefox. Uh, you can turn tracking protection on in Firefox. You can turn it on to be to be active all the time. So not just in your private windows, but we can block trackers everywhere that you browse. Uh, if you don't use Firefox, uh, there are some some more add-ons, some more extensions that you can install that will give you tracking protection. Uh, one is called Privacy Badger, which is also from EFF that I mentioned earlier. Um, another one is called uBlock Origin, uh, and I hesitate to mention the last one, Ghostery, but some people uh, still use it. Really, I, I would encourage you to use Privacy Badger or uBlock Origin. You could use both. Basically, if you start to add more tracking protection to your browsers, you might find some web pages that don't work quite right um, because the, the tool has blocked something that the page required. Um, so uh, that's why I'd maybe only install one and see if it figures all right. Uh, on mobile tracking protection, so on my mobile device, I have started to, I played with this tool called Lockdown. Wow, it, that name has not aged well. Um, but so the, the Lockdown application on your mobile device will basically give you tracking protection around an iOS device. So a lot of times when you open apps on a mobile device, they will also sort of record what you're doing in these apps and send it out to third parties. Uh, and this will block that. Uh, for Android, you can install what's called NetGuard, uh, which does a similar thing. So if you have an Android device and you want to block trackers from sort of seeing what you're doing inside of your Android apps, you can use NetGuard. Um, last one, mind your, or not last, but, um, so the next one would be mind your permissions. Um, so this is just kind of a, a like with the, you know, be mindful of phishing. Um, permissions can be quite invasive. So if you have ever like browsed to a website and it said, this site wants your location, wants permission to access your location. Um, a lot of people just click allow on everything because they're like, oh, I need to use the site. So I just allow everything. Um, just be careful if you go to a site that shouldn't really need your location, uh, just don't allow it. <laughs> um, this is, again, trackers use uh, sort of uh, this and other permissions to track what you're doing online. Uh, this is also true if you sign into things with Facebook or you sign into things with Google or you sign into things or sign up for things um, with some of your social accounts. Uh, look at the permissions that that thing is asking for. Um, you may have heard of this thing called Cambridge Analytica. Uh, this is exactly how Cambridge Analytica happened with Facebook is they had a very small survey application uh, and they sent it out to a bunch of Facebook uh, people. When people connected that application to their Facebook account, Cambridge Analytica got the list, their, their friends list, um, their names, their profiles, everything got all of their face, all of the data that they had, had that they had on Facebook, Cambridge Analytica never had. 
Um, so this is actually the kind of thing that allowed Cambridge Analytica is people were just using these applications, signing up, they weren't looking at the permissions and they were just saying, yes, let's just allow everything. Um, inside of Facebook, to put a fine point on that one, if you go to the settings in Facebook, there is a, a part of the settings that says apps and websites. And you can go in there and it will actually tell you if you've, it'll show you if you've done this already with some apps and websites. And you can go through and you can remove them. So when I went and did this, I had like 15 or something from years and years ago that I guess I had signed in or signed up for or something. I had forgotten about them. But those applications still had access to my Facebook data. So by going into my Facebook settings, my apps and websites, I could remove you know, all of the ones that I knew I wasn't using anymore. Uh, also with a Facebook application, Facebook's particularly bad about permissions. Um, and when I say Facebook, I mean also Instagram and WhatsApp because they're both owned by Facebook. Um, so they, their applications, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Messenger will typically ask for a lot of permissions and a lot of the data that they get from that uh, they use to track you and, and those kinds of things. So, um, but this is kind of a good general rule for installing any mobile application. Um, when you install a mobile application, these days it's getting better where you can sort of um, only allow the permission when it's needed rather than when you install. Um, it used to be the case that on a mobile app, like a, you would download a mobile flashlight application and as soon as you download the flashlight and want to install it, it would ask for your contact list. And you're like, a flashlight does not need to know who I'm talking to. <laughs> um, nowadays, uh, you can install an application and only when you try to use the camera feature of the application does it ask for permission to use your camera, which I think is much better. So that's gotten a lot better in the last couple of years, um, but still pay attention to the permissions. Um, check your data breach status. So this is another one that I work on at Firefox. Um, so we all hear about these data breaches where Millions and millions of accounts um, get exposed because you know some big website has um, has a data breach. So uh, this is a this is a site that I work on uh, that I work on and maintain right now. It's monitor.firefox.com, and uh, when you go there, you can put in your email address, and we can tell you which data breaches you've been in. Um, so for, I'll just give you my particular one. This was my results. I'm in 16 data breaches. Um, and what we do is on each of these data breaches, you can click to learn more about it. And then we can tell you uh, sort of what data was in the breach. And that would be like in this case, there were passwords in it. There were phone numbers, there were email addresses and usernames. And then we tell you what you need to do. Um, so it's, it's clipped off at the bottom here, but we'll tell you okay, this breach involved passwords. So if you're in it, which you are, you need to go change your password. Like, especially if you're using this password on a bunch of other websites, um, you need to go change the password. Uh, we also allow you to, let me see if we can try to put this in here. Yeah, uh, so change your password, update any other logins where you might've been using the same password. Um, and then, Uh, what, what I forget to tout on this thing, if you go to monitor.firefox.com and you scan for yourself, uh, we can also send you an email alert if you're ever in a future data breach. Um, so we have a uh, partnership with a uh, security expert who's in Australia who monitors all of these data breaches. Um, and so if you subscribe to our service, uh, then we can if there's a new data breach that comes out and it lands in his database as, okay, yeah, this is a legitimate data breach of this website. If you are in that data breach, uh, we can send you an email that says, uh-oh, you know, you were in a data breach. Here's the website that was breached. Here's the data. Here's what you should do about being in that breach. Um, so that's, again, that's monitor.firefox.com is uh, sort of one of the main things I work on right now. Um, and so the, one of the biggest concerns we have with the data breaches is um, the passwords that are in them. And uh, what hackers will do is they will get into, let's say, the adobe.com. I pick on Adobe. I shouldn't. They get angry when I pick on them. 
but adobe.com has a breach um, and everyone has their username and password on adobe.com. Uh, and what a hacker will do is get all of those usernames and passwords, and then they will try all of those usernames and passwords on some other websites, right? So they will go over to LinkedIn and they might be able, if you're using the same password on LinkedIn as you were on Adobe, then all they have to do is punch in your username and password from Adobe and it works on LinkedIn also. And now they're in your LinkedIn account or your bank account or your email account. Um, there's an interesting thing that's happened recently. Two examples. Um, one is when Disney Plus launched. Uh, there was pretty quickly within a day or two on the dark web, there was a list of about a million or two million Disney Plus accounts for sale. And so at first, everyone thought that Disney Plus had a data breach, that a hacker had got into Disney Plus and stolen a bunch of usernames and passwords. Uh, what had actually happened is that everybody who was signing up for Disney Plus was reusing their usernames and passwords that they had used on Adobe and LinkedIn and all these other places. And since those breaches have been out there forever and people haven't been changing their passwords or using new passwords, all hackers had to do was as soon as a new service launches or becomes popular, all they have to do is go try a bunch of the same usernames and passwords on the new thing. And so they took over you know, a couple million people's Disney Plus accounts, not, not by hacking Disney Plus, but just because all these data breaches that have happened. Uh, and then similarly, just recently, uh, Zoom has been really hammered by this too. So Zoom is getting incredibly popular. Everyone's using it, uh, flocking to this and sort of Microsoft Teams and some other online video tools. And uh, yeah, so there's another list of, I think like 500,000 or a million Zoom accounts for sale on the dark web, um, just because people were new, a whole bunch of new people were signing up for Zoom and they were all using the same username and password that they've been using for everything. And so hackers were just using the old data breaches and taking over Zoom accounts too. Um, so that's why it's important if you are in a breach and, and one that has passwords, you need to change the password on that site, but then you also need to go change uh, any other sites where you're reusing that password, uh, which gets us to probably one of the stickiest, hardest things um, that a lot of people can talk. I, I hate passwords so much. Um, everybody probably hates passwords so much. Um, but with, what you really should be doing is using a unique password on every site. Um, so this will stop those attacks that I just described, where people will take a password that they saw from your LinkedIn or Adobe account and try to use it on some new account. If you have a different password on that other account, that doesn't work. Um, so if we talk about passwords, the old advice, and I'm giving you permission as a security expert advisor person, is to ignore this old advice as much as you can, which was to use like uncommon words and do a mix of, you know, capitals and lowercase and numbers and symbols and all these things and have a password that looks like in this top left here, which is, you know, troubadour and three or something silly, right? Um, that was the old advice because the idea was if you have all of these weird things, it's hard to, it's hard, harder to guess that password, right? The problem is that what it did is it made that password impossible for a human to remember, but a computer doesn't care how weird your password is. It just tries a ton of things, right? So that Troubadour password um, takes a computer three days to guess. Uh, if it could guess a thousand guesses a second, right? But it's impossible for someone to remember it. Okay, so that's the old advice. The new advice is to do something more like four random words or, or just four words or like a long, uh, maybe six or seven word quote from a song or a Bible verse or, or something, right? That is a little bit specific to you, but it needs to be really, really long, right? And so the, this random four words password, correct horse battery staple, is would take 550 years for a computer to try to guess that. But it's way more uh, comprehensible to a human, right? Um, so the new, the new password advice is to do something more like this bottom part. Use four random words or four common words or four words. You want it to be nice and long. Um, 
and you will more likely be able to remember it, and it takes a lot longer for a computer to try and guess it. Um, so this is the new advice on, on passwords. Uh, there is EFF again, has this kind of fun thing uh, for making passwords like this, uh, which is EFF.org slash dice. Uh, you can go check that out. Um, but sort of the, the, the real trick here is to start using a password manager. Um, so what a password manager does is we have one uh, called Lockwise uh, that Firefox has, but there's a number of them out there. Uh, our Mozilla internal like sort of info security team recommends these ones. Uh, so the first one is called 1Password, so it's the number one password. Uh, and then a couple, 1Password uh, is not free. The, the one underneath there, LastPass, is free. And I believe Dashlane is also free. So these are, the, these are the three that Mozilla IT people suggest all of us who are Mozilla employees to use some of these. Um, uh, let me look at, I'm not sure why Bitwarden is on there. Uh, oh yeah, there is one called Bitwarden, which is also free, I believe, um, that you can also check out. Uh, but let's talk about LastPass. LastPass has a free version. Um, and it has uh, basically a browser plugin as well as mobile applications. So uh, I don't remember if we had demos. Did we, we used, we did demos, didn't we, Caitlin, of password managers before? I'm not sure if I can do a demo. I don't know if I can do a demo on this format or not. Um, yeah, I, you have, but I don't know if it'll share quite well. Yeah. Um, but essentially, if you check these things out, a lot of them have good sort of how to get started videos and things like that that you can walk through on your own. Um, we could do many, many days of just password manager stuff. Uh, but the idea behind a password manager is that you create a new unique password, one of those strong unique passwords, for which it becomes your master password, um, which is why 1Password is called 1Password. You only need that one password from now on. Uh, then when you go to sign up for an account or sign into an account, uh, your password manager will create a unique, long, strong password for that account. And then if you create a new account, it'll make a different password for every single account and it will save all of those passwords inside of your password manager. Then anytime you need to sign into something, uh, rather than try to remember you know, 50 different passwords, uh, when you sign in, it will prompt you for your one master password, which you type into your master password, your uh, one password tool, and then it will go get uh, the password out of your password manager and put it into the form for you. Uh, so this is what a password manager does. It replaces, it lets you have 50 different passwords, but you only have the one master password, the one strong password that unlocks all of the others. Um, okay, and then another great thing for uh, that problem of if you reuse the same username and password and it is in a data breach and all of a sudden people can get into your other accounts is to use what's called two-factor or sometimes multi-factor authentication. Um, so the idea behind two-factor or multi-factor authentication uh, is you can set it up, for example, on your Google account. Um, what will happen if you do it on your Google account is, oh, this is on my city account. I, I used to have, I had good demos for this. Um, when you set it up on your Google account, it will ask you to install an app, the Google Authenticator app on your phone. And then anytime you are signing into your Google account from a new device that Google has not seen you sign in from before, it will prompt you to put in a six digit code. And the six digit code is only on your mobile device. Um, so what this means is that someone to get into your account has to steal your password and they now also have to steal your phone, your physical phone, because that code is tied physically to your phone. Um, you can set this up, for example, with Citi. Uh, you can set this up to uh, get a text message. So on a Citi account, you can say, uh, you have your password for your online banking, your city account, and then you can say, I want a second factor, 
which is send me a text message that has a six digit code in it. So if I go to a new computer and I try to sign into my online banking account, I have my username and my password, it will say, we just texted you a six digit code. Now you need to punch in a six digit code. And so the idea here is that if somebody steals my username and password for my online banking, and then they go and try to sign into my account, they won't be able to sign in unless they also steal my phone, which gets the six digit code, right? Um, so that's the idea. There's always um, someone who points out how texting is not actually super secure, um, which it isn't because there's all these sort of um, attacks that you can do I'm not gonna go into, um, but essentially it's more secure than <laughs> not having it, right? So if you have just a username and a password on your account and someone goes to sign into your online banking account and they have your username and password and they're just in. So having a text message is at least more secure than that, right? Um, but if you can, uh, probably the, the best way to do it is how Google forces you to do it and how you can do it with a lot of other sites is to use a specific application on your mobile phone, on the smartphone to do this rather than texting if you can. Um, but we're getting close to our time and I want to, okay, I want to stop here and open it up for questions because I want to let people go who need to go. We only have the one hour. And then I also want to make sure that people can ask uh, questions specific to you. <laughs> yeah, um, so our first question was from Tim. Um, he's asking about VPNs and if he should get one for his home computer and smartphones at home, um, and then might need to explain what a VPN is for the room. Yeah, so, um, so VPN is, stands for Virtual Private Network, um, and it is uh, helpful for securing your connection between uh, your device and a lot of play, it used to be mostly for work. So there would be a VPN server at an office building and people working from home would connect to their work VPN and now they would be connected to the office network as well. Uh, these days, which is also now becoming important, people working from home, um, if, you're, if you're being forced to work from home and some of your employers um, may have told you you need to install the VPN software and hopefully they've helped you set it up and things like that, that's what a VPN uh, is sort of for. The consumer VPNs, um, what they do is a similar sort of deal where uh, they create a secure connection between your computer uh, or your device and the VPN provider. Uh, so if you think of it in those kinds of terms, what they're really doing is they're hiding your uh, network connection from your internet service provider. Um, so me at home, I have Cox as my internet service provider. Uh, if I am not using a VPN, then all of my connections, all of the sites that I visit and things like that are going through Cox as my internet service provider, which means that Cox, not everything, but they can see some things about the websites that I visit, or if there's any um, insecure pages that I'm visiting, they can see that kind of stuff. What a VPN does is it mostly protects you from uh, anyone that is on your same network. So like at home, I have this Wi-Fi network, um, which has a password on it, but if somebody happens to be on my Wi-Fi network, they can see what I'm doing. My internet service provider can see what I'm doing. What the VPN does is it stops anyone who happens to be sharing my network and my internet service provider from seeing things because it creates a secure connection between just my computer and this VPN provider. When we talk about VPNs, um, what it's really doing is it's shifting trust from your internet service provider to your VPN provider. Um, so there are a lot of kind of free VPN providers. Um, so you download this app and it's completely free and it's a VPN and look how secure. Those ones are only taking care of that sort of that hacker who is sharing your network with you. Because quite often what those free VPNs are doing is they are monitoring. So from a security standpoint, they're okay. From a privacy standpoint, they're a nightmare because they're pr probably looking at all the things that you do online and they're taking that data and then they're selling it, right? And that's how they're making their money. That's why they can give you a VPN for free. 
Um, so in terms of VPN providers, uh, the, the trustworthy ones, well, okay, so now we have a Firefox VPN. Um, and that is if you go to uh, FPN, which stands for Firefox Private Network, if you go to fpn.firefox.com, um, we have a VPN service now that works on uh, Windows and Android and iOS and soon Mac. Um, we have a VPN partner who's called Mulvad. Uh, and Mulvad is probably one of the top two VPN providers in the world in terms of privacy and security. Um, so ours is not free because we charge for it because it costs, it costs money to operate it and we don't get any of your data or sell it. Um, so that's probably a good one. FPN from Firefox. Mulvad is sort of an, is our partner on FPN. And then Proton VPN is probably the other one. So I would, those three VPN providers are sort of the, the most trusted, respected uh, VPN providers that are out there. Because like I said, what you're really doing is you're shifting your trust in your internet service provider that you have right now. You're shifting that to a VPN provider. And so you want to pick a VPN provider that you can actually trust. Um, another question we got was um, regarding information when somebody Googles you. Um, are there some steps you can take to erase your name, address, and phone number um, from when people look you up on Google? Uh, the answer is yes, there are. But unfortunately, they're not great. Um, there is one website that you can use, and I've, I've, I have a Mozilla colleague who really likes it and uses it. It's, um, I think it's joindeleteme.com. Um, so this is made by a company called Abine, A-B-I-N-E. And what they do, because quite often this is a very manual, tedious process to do this, um, what they will do is they will sort of automate that for you a bit. So you can give them a couple of key identifiers that you're interested in having these things not show up in Google search results and not show up on people's search websites. Um, and they will sort of take over the job of removing those things when they find them online. They kind of sort of work most of the time, maybe. Um, there is a uh, book called Extreme privacy. Hold on a second. Um, so this this book uh, is written by a former uh, sort of. Uh, he won't really say which government agency. Former online investigator for some kind of government agency, where he would do what's called OSINT and try to find people online by their digital footprints. Um, so this book, as the title suggests, is pretty extreme. Um, he has chapters in there about how to register your pets anonymously and all kinds of you know, kind of crazy things, um, which is sort of fun to read about anyway. Uh, his take is he has a workbook, a worksheet that you can go through to remove yourself from some of the most popular people searching engines that are out there. Uh, it's a pretty tedious process. Um, so it's way more than what we can get into right here. Uh, that is possible and you may have mixed results with it. Um, but join deleteme.com and then uh, this book, Extreme Privacy, can help you with that kind of stuff. And I'll make sure to send out some uh, library books that we have on privacy topics too with that email next week. Um, we got an example of a pretty um, good fake that somebody recently got in an email where somebody had emailed them saying that they had a previous password of theirs, which was an actual password, um, and threatened to give out private information and videos from their, from their account uh, unless they gave them a substantial amount of money. Um, and that was something that he had recently gotten in an email. Just wanted to share that with everybody. Yeah, and so these are typically just scams. And not necessarily, like, I, the truth is that they, they probably have a, they, it's, it's relatively easy for a hacker to go somewhere and buy for $10 or $15 uh, the data breach from LinkedIn, which has a lot of people's email addresses and passwords next to it. And so what they have found, what hackers have found is that for a while, a lot of that credential stuffing was working, um, but then it stopped working because people actually started to change their passwords. Um, so 
Now what they try to do is they try to send these scam emails that have a historical password. Like, hey, I have one of your passwords, which means now I've infected your machine and I've, you know, I've, I've watched you watch porn on the internet and now I'm gonna release these videos of you watching porn on the internet and you, unless you pay me whatever Bitcoin and stuff like that. Um, they're scams, right? So they, they have, they have your, your breach data um, but they're really just trying to scam you and scare you again. That's the tactic of the scammers and the fishers is they want, they want to scare you into, you know, doing something quickly or they don't want you to be embarrassed and things like that. Um, so no, just because they have your old password from your LinkedIn data breach does not mean that they hacked your webcam and they, you know, recorded you watching porn or something like that. Um, those are just scams. Well, I think that's going to be the end of our, our questions for the day. Um, Luke, thank you for joining us. I appreciate you teaching this class um, and I appreciate everyone for coming. Um, I will be making this recording available probably Monday or Tuesday next week and I'll email it out uh, to everybody that registered. I'll also include a list to some of the resources that Luke talked about today. Um, so if you didn't catch something, hopefully I will get it in that email on Monday. Um, but thank you and you all have a great day. Good weekend. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks.